everyone, and welcome to the All It Takes Is A Goal podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. I'm your host, John Acuff, and today is the conclusion of my interview with Greg McEwen. Boom, boom, boom. Did that feel dramatic? I hope it felt dramatic. It did to me. We'll jump right into the stunning conclusion in just a minute. But first, today's episode is sponsored by MetaShare. Have you guys ever had buyer's remorse? You know, that feeling of intense regret because the thing you thought you just had to have was only something you used once or twice. For me, it was the time I bought a really expensive road bike because I thought I was going to get into cycling. I proceeded to hang it on the wall in my garage and feel ashamed for six months. Well, I know some of you are experiencing buyer's remorse right now for something much more frustrating. You know what I'm talking about. It's the health care you rushed to get during open enrollment last December. Well, I have some good news for you. You've probably heard me talking about our main sponsor for this podcast, MetaShare. And these guys have the answer to healthcare buyer's remorse. Check this out. Members of MetaShare save up to 50% or more per month on their healthcare costs. They say the typical family saves up to $500 per month. And here's the best part. You can become a member at any time. So that means it isn't too late to ditch your buyer's remorse and switch to a more affordable healthcare that will save you money and help you sleep better at night. If this is your first time you're hearing about MetaShare, it is the best alternative to health insurance that allows you to share the burden of medical bills, offers access to 900,000 plus healthcare providers, and has a proven 25-year track record. Plus, in addition to saving hundreds per month as a member of MediShare, you will also have access to free telehealth and free telecounseling. You won't find that with any traditional health insurance provider. Guys, it only takes two minutes to see how much you could save. Go investigate that for yourself and your family at metashare.com slash John. That's metashare.com slash John. Remember, John doesn't have an H in it. So it's M-E-D-I, that's meta, share, S-H-A-R-E, dot com slash J-O-N. All right, if you want the full Greg bio, listen to episode 19. But here are the cliff notes. Greg McEwen is awesome. His book, Essentialism, sold more than a million copies, and his new book, Effortless, just came out, and it's fantastic. We spoke together last Monday, and here is the second part of that conversation. I'm curious, in the seven years between this book and the last book, did you ever find yourself pushing an upper limit beyond what you wanted? And you were, because what happens when you have a successful book in our space is you got to scale. Greg, like you should have a bigger team. You should be doing these things. You should like, you should, you know, there's all these things that you could be doing. You should have a hundred staff. You should, you know, <laughs> did you get tempted to do that and you had to pull back or were you pretty consistent at going, no, for me to create the kind of work I create, the kind of ideas I create, the, this is an upper limit on this part of my business or this part of what I do. I had an experience years ago when I was in Stephen Covey's office with his, uh, with his staff. And actually the moment, I think I shared this with you off, off air, but the, there, was a, there was a moment when um, somebody came into the office that I was in and just said, oh, um, we have an inquiry for a keynote. It's in Washington, D.C. What's the fee? And they answered the question in front of me. And it was like a high fee point. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to teach and write. I mean, I was still a college student at the time. And I, would, I just was like this. I just want this. Yeah. If I could try and create this, I don't need the whole business, the whole, yeah. you know, they had Franklin Covey at the time. I don't want Franklin Covey. That feels like a headache, a burden. Mm -hmm. But if I could just do this, a little team, and then just, just teach. Yeah. And just and I'm, I don't mind. I'm, I'm satisfied to teach the same thing again and again. I mean, you don't really ever teach the same thing. No. You renew and you're it. always renewing it with freshness. You are. And so, and so it's, it's never the same thing, but just, just don't get bored of teaching the same thing uh, so that you, can, that you can actually get a message out, get it mm. to cross the chasm. I mean, and even now, so I, I feel like I'm jumping around now, but. No, no, please. Uh, but but I, I feel like. So, so that was that was the, the the unit. Like that was one boundary for me. I don't want to build the big thing. I just want to be able to figure out how to speak and have a best-selling book and to repeat, repeat, repeat. And mm -hmm. and related to that, it's like I'm not even sure if now essentialism has done what it needs to do. 
Like even now I'm not bored of it. Yeah, there's still room. There's still tons of room. There's, there was, and, and my, what I want to happen, what I'm still in for the long run to do is to help it just keep, I don't know, is it crossed the chasm already? Maybe it has, I don't know. I don't, but like to get to a point where it just goes, this is part of the, I mean, it's very presumptuous, but it's like, what, you, what I want is it becomes like somehow a classic, you know, it's like, this is, sure. Hey, if you, if you're going to read 10 books on, on success and you like, there it is, this is one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, and so to do that, you have to be willing to go on it just quietly, steadily for a long journey. Yeah. Don't get yeah. bored of it. Yeah. You, you've said it. I've said it a hundred times, but the person listening is the first time they've ever heard it. So just be willing to be in that in, engagement. And, and so that has affected my willingness to just, well, I guess one of the reasons I haven't written a book every 18 months, I just wanted to have one idea the last mm-hmm. 10 years. Really, I suppose my deepest aspirations are like it lasts 100 years, you know, that like I'm mm-hmm. gone, but it's still here. And um, somebody just wrote me the nicest compliment about effortless. I almost like, I almost want to share it with you. Oh, please. I don't know. It feels very presumptuous to share it too, but. Well, don't, I mean, but don't, yeah. If you're worried about their privacy, just say they're from Texas. Texas is so big, <laughs> they won't even know it's them. I love that line. Um, okay, give, give me a second here. All right, I, won't, I won't say who it is, but they're an author. They say, greetings from Texas, not Texas. Yeah, exactly. Probably Dallas. Just finished the new book. They said, my heavens, it is absolute brilliance. That's what they wrote. And then they, but this was the really reason I was sharing it, because that's just too much. But they said, congrats on another book that will outlive us all. Oh, come on. Boom. Now, I love it. There's plenty of people who won't feel that about Effortless. I, and maybe no one else will feel that about Effortless. It's just him. But it was such a beautiful sentiment, whether the book is that or not. That's what I want. Yeah. Not some big thing, not some flashy thing, but to write in a way that it just outlives us. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is what I'm that I'm in for that. I'm in for that all day long. I I absolutely love that. You know, in order to be effortless, one of the things you talk about that I loved was chapter three, where it opens with you wearing a full stormtrooper outfit. <laughs> You're standing in the mirror. You've carried around this idea for 30 years. Early, you know, 30 years before your brother said, that would be amazing to own a full Stormtrooper outfit. And I feel like in that moment, you say, wait a second. Like, am I carrying around an old goal, essentially, like that I don't really care about anymore? And it now becomes a catchphrase or what I'd say a, a soundtrack for you and your wife, where is this a Stormtrooper? Mm-hmm. Do you, you know... Talk to somebody who came to this podcast that maybe they've told themselves for 10 years, I need, I'm sh- I should write a book. I should write a book. I should write a book. And th- maybe that's a stormtrooper for them. How do we let go of some of these things mm. that we think we're supposed to do that maybe we've never stopped to turn and look at them and go, <laughs> this is no, I'm not. I don't want to own this stormtrooper outfit. I believe this a long time ago. I kept believing it. it's time to believe something else. One of my a business school professors said that goals are the theory that work. Um, actually, it's quite a good, it's quite a good one-liner for this, for this podcast and this theme, but goals are the theory that work. And he was giving both praise and warning because the first thing he's saying is like, there's so many theories in business school. There's so many theories in, in universities that are like, yeah, I mean, they kind of work, they kind of don't, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So he's like, goals work. When you set goals, when you write them down, especially if you look at them a few times, so they become like intentional soundtracks of a different kind for you. They work. They go into you. You start living it out at an unconscious level. And I 100% believe that. Uh, and, and if you want to change the trajectory of your whole life, you will set goals that you don't believe right now. Mm-hmm. And as I'm riffing on the positive side of goals for a second, I, w- I went to a camp. I was asked to to do a thing at, at, at a Steve Harvey camp for at-risk teenage boys. Mm-hmm. And he was doing his thing with the, with the mothers of the boys, so single moms of, of these at-risk boys. And he just said, listen up here. He said, I'm going to tell you how to change your world. He says, you, it's not very, it sounds at first like a very non-essentialist idea, actually. Uh, but it grabbed, grabbed my attention. He said, you write down 400 things that you would dream to do if you could mm-hmm. and and then he said actually for all of you here to be honest just do a hundred because you're, you're never going to 
get to 400. Mm -hmm. He said, what's going to happen is you're going to stop the list and you're going to get to like 32 and you're done. You don't even have anything more. That's everything that you have ever wanted or thought about achieving. He said, you just aren't setting goals boldly enough. Keep going, keep pushing, ask a bigger question, ask it again. And so this is all the, the upside of goals. You start setting them and you start reviewing them and reviewing them. At first, they're impossible. Then they become improbable. And then they become, well, you know, maybe possible, then eventually doable. And then they start happening. And that changes everything again because yeah. you go, well, if that process is possible, if you can go yeah. from impossible to done, what else is impossible? That could you're, then you're in done? a candy shop. You feel like a kid in a candy okay. shop, and you're like, "Does anybody else know this?" You feel like <laughs> you've what? You like you want to? You feel like Tim uh, Robbins at the end of Shawshank. Like you're in the river. <laughs> it's raining on you. You take your shirt off, and you're like, "What? Does anybody else know goals work?" Like that's that. I love that. That's exactly how I feel. So that's all the positive side, and I'm a huge believer in that. And I've I've taken that challenge. I have never got to 400 items because I found the same thing happened. You get to about 50, you're about done. But I've kept going and kept going, and just added. I just add ludicrous things to it. As whenever I come across things that are so interesting, oh, that would could be mm -hmm. cool, and I put them there. This is all a perhaps list, and I'm not committed to all these things. Sure, but let them expand. That's the good side. But the dark side, right? The dark side of goals is that they can live on in you forever when you don't know they are. So they've outlived their usefulness. And of course, it's not just goals that outlive their usefulness. So the Stormtrooper was a goal. I mean, I didn't know it was a goal. I never wrote it down as a goal. But something in my right. mind was like, must do this cool thing, must get a movie level quality you know, suit one day. And then as I'm on the edge of actually being able to do it, I'm like, I have no interest in this. That I don't want this anymore. I'm not. 10 anymore. It's past its, its best by date. So I think reviewing the goals of your life every so often and just asking, is it a stormtrooper? Is this, do I really want this? We better want what we really want because often those things come to pass and maybe that isn't the thing you want anymore. You've got to reevaluate it. I think a, a comparison to that is when somebody buys a beach house and they love the story of the beach house, but not the reality. <laughs> So they said, someday, that's what I'll have. I'll have a beach house. Yes. But none of the reality matched what they really <laughs> care about. And they get to the beach exactly. house and they're like, I have to fix it every time I'm here. Yep. Only my relatives get to use it. It's stressful. <laughs> the ocean is trying to destroy me at every second of the ocean's day. Right. But I told myself when I was 18 or 22 or whatever, someday I'll have a beach house. I, I always think about that with when it comes to, is that a stormtrooper? Yes. I'm curious. I, uh, I asked a leader once, um, why do influencers, leaders, business owners, why do they sometimes kind of fall apart? Why do they combust? And he mm. said, it's two things. Mm. And he studied this. He said, it's two things. And one I knew, one was surprising. He said, one is they're isolated. That felt obvious to me. The mm. Even the best leader makes terrible mistakes when they're isolated. Like mm. a phrase I always say is, Leaders who can't be questioned end up doing questionable things. Mm. Um, but the second one he mm. said was they don't have a life-giving hobby, which related to me to your mm. like, can it be fun? Can it be rewarding? Um, he said their entire identity becomes wrapped up in the thing they're doing. Mm. There's no life-giving hobby where they're learning new things that aren't related to that at all. So I'm curious for you, what are some of your hobbies? Like swimming sounds like it's one. It sounds like there's joy there. Like what are some other life-giving hobbies for you? Well, my children are my hobby. And that's for real. My best friend growing up, Sam Bridgestock, used to say that. And it was just such a good soundtrack to absorb myself and to go, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour my creative energy into this. It's not just something I, I'm responsible for. It's not just a chore. It's not just something that's important. But okay, we're going to get through it. Like, what if this is a hobby? I'm going to learn how to do this better. I'm going to build relationships with them. I'm going to have fun with them. We're going to go on trips together. I, I would travel when travel was a thing back then. I would have maybe 80% of the time, I'd have one of my children come, come with me. And we would just, that. I thought that would be so good for them. And it turns out that it was so good for me. Because what it did is it turned these very routine trips, right? taxi, hotel, you know, airport, you know, repeat into an adventure. We would, well, where can we eat? Where's fun? Where's interesting? Let's have an experience. Okay, let, let's turn this into a ritual. 
uh, that's rewarding in and of itself. Let's go. We would end up going to, we always end up going to some museum. I would never do that. No, when you travel alone, you're never, never like when that. somebody says, oh, you went to Seattle. What did you see? I always say, I saw the Marriott lobby and then I saw the room. And then like, that's the circle I did. I never am going exploring. But if I had my daughter with me or one of my daughters, that's, that makes sense. That's what that changed it for me. And so I remember saying, in fact, years ago when my children were little and I had them, you know, one of them with me. And I said in this, in, you know, in the keynote, I said, you know, well, the children are young, we love it now. I mean, teenagers, that'll be that'll be a rough ride. And someone came up to me afterwards and just they just wanted to talk to me about that comment. And they just said that basically they said they didn't have these words, but they just said that is a soundtrack, even though you're joking about it, it's a soundtrack. It doesn't have to be. You you could just have an amazing relationship with my your teenagers, because that's that's what's happening with me right now. It has happened. And I that really like made an impression on me. And I thought, well, what if it could be great? What if teenagehood could be terrific? Experience? And I think it can. I think parents over like we do a broken soundtrack when we said when we say, oh, it's going to be the worst. Like because people will ask me, do your kids hate you yet? And I'll say, <laughs> no, like what a tear. Like, no, they're I, like I love my teenage daughters like they one just went to the prom and we're, you know, doing all these new things. So I think that that's such a weird thing that we do when we predict it has to be that way i, I want to be sensitive to the people that that are having a rough time right now to you it can be very very tough but i also want to say speak the other soundtrack of like it can be great right now i have four basically teenagers 18 to 12 and i'm just genuinely amazed by them and i love to be with them we love doing things together we love swimming we love playing tennis together it's hardly a day right now. I'm not that my son isn't like tapping on me. Hey, can we go play? We don't play for like a long time, but we'll play even between events. I'll just go and play for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And we just get outside and we just get to play. And it's like really enjoyable to be with him. And he's growing into someone who's, it's just so, I find him so funny. I find him so entertaining. I find him insightful, uh, wiser than me. Even now, I find some things he'll be, I'm like, well, that's just good judgment there, man. That's just like better than I'm seeing the way I'm seeing it. Yeah. And certainly wiser than I was at his age. And so I, I think, you know, that's, a, that is definitely a life giving hobby for me. One of the things Mike, uh, one of my daughters did that reminded me of your book about figuring out kind of the rules of the game and then playing, you know, understanding what, you know, what really mattered. And you, you told a story about a friend in school who was good at that and would say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And then you would kind of overwork on some things that you felt like maybe they were the wrong things to overwork on. So I loved that, that thinking of, okay, well, he, how do we get the greatest results with the minimum effort? That's something you talk about a lot. I've got a, a few other questions. Good. So this summer, one of the things we're doing with our daughters is where their summer job is to read 15 amazing books. Mm. Um, we there's 15 books that we're picking out there. A lot of them are fiction, but if you were going to put, um, a book on a, Hey, if I could get every teenager to read or every young adult to read these books, um, this kind of education, what would be a book that you'd put on there? Oh, um, I mean, one answer I have to that is, um, there's a, there's a Josh ship is a teenage whisperer. Oh, I know Josh. Yeah, we're friends. Oh, wait, I'm so happy to hear that. And and he made a list of like 18 books that every 18 year old should read before their mm -hmm. 18th birthday. And now I'm trying to remember what what he puts on it and and, and what what I would put on it. Um I'm gonna pause here for a second as I try and come up with a good answer. Well we've put on things like um Tale of Two Cities, um Count of Monte Cristo, um my Antonia, you know, books like that. So I, you know, so you can answer the question that way. The other way you could answer a book question, because I'm curious is what's the book you've given away more than your own? I've probably given The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield away more than any other book. When somebody is stuck creatively, I say, oh, this book really helped me. What's a book that in your life you've given away more than other books? Uh, I, I'm going to give a few because I just, I just don't have one that I think should work here. But um I think that John Adams by Michael McCullough, uh, by David McCullough, excuse me, is terrific. I just called up to speak to his wife. David's not well anymore. And it was just so nice to just say, spend some time talking with her, but just to thank her for him and for what she has done to enable him to write so well for so long. 
I mean, he wrote the into- all of these extraordinary Pulitzer Prize winning books just from like a tiny little office, tiny on a, on a on a typewriter uh, in the back of his, you know, just just in his his house in Boston. He wasn't trained historian when he began all of this. He's not, he doesn't know anything about any of the subjects he writes about before he decides to write about them. Really? Yeah, nothing. He's got. He's got. No, he just goes. Wow, I'm so intrigued about this story. What happened there? And he goes and he always wants the the primary sources. So he's actually going and reading the journals of the people that were there, not the book about the journals of the people that were there. He just writes the stories he has it. I mean that that I love his writing. I love there's a book that he wrote. Let's see, try and see if I can remember the name now. Um I'll do subtitles. Greg is looking at books right now on his shelf. <laughs> Um, he's turned his shoulder. This is like subtitles of a movie. Um, he's looking. There's no ladder in his in his library that I can tell. But I, f- I feel like there might be a lab- like a ladder on the other side of the library. We're seeing the smaller part of the library. Um, it's probably near the tennis court that he just referred to. So um, it's, it's hard to tell. I can't. I can't see. He's that. laughing because I'm making comical statements. It's um. It's a. It's it's it's, it's a it's a, a book that he wrote about like essays that he and speeches that he gave about the spirit of America. It might even be called spirit of America, but David McCullough. Was that 1776? No, was that no, the title? no, no. 1776 okay. is a terrific book. And that's just literally about that year. So it's not just about okay. the revolution. It's that year. And there's another, you know, terrific book. Um, yeah. It's called the spirit, the American spirit, uh, American, the spirit. American spirit. Uh, by David McCullough. Love that. I mean, I mean, you could write just to read about just anything you wrote, but I love the Wright Brothers by him as well. Uh, so those are three books just by him that I think are terrific. I think Boys in the Perfect. Boys in the Boat should be on the list. If you read that story, Boys in the Boat, is about these 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 students uh, who go, eventually go to the Berlin Olympic Games and win gold. It's their story. Most of them actually come from working class backgrounds. And in a way, it's about the struggle of their journey. And yet, if you read it, you find they don't seem stressed and burned out in the way that so many people do in today's society. So they have achieved this unbelievable thing, even while they have a job on the side, they may be going to school, and they're preparing to go to the Olympics. And it isn't the strain and the, the it isn't like that. And I think part of the reason is because they just, when they're doing one thing, they're doing that thing. When they're doing the next thing, they're doing that thing. There's a certain piece about it. And then there's another example of effortlessness in that story that I think is relevant, which is they get into, there's a name for, for what it is when you're, when, you're on a, when you're on a rowing team and you get in swing. I don't think the word is swing. It becomes everyone is in complete sync and it is effortless. It's just completely smooth uh and and so there are there are all sorts of essentialist and effortless elements to that story uh and i would recommend that book too my my children read endlessly uh my eldest who just applied to university i said when she was applying i said look you should just write down at least somewhere all the books that you've read Mm -hmm. uh you know since being 12 years old so i don't mean elementary books and she stopped at 200 uh, that's amazing and that's amazing and, and the others the others are, are probably even further ahead on that curve because that, that's their whole curriculum is just reading 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 and they just uh they're now they've become nobody likes a book pusher and yeah. uh and now their book pushes to me ah uh, yeah yeah it's, 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 i it's, i try not to do that but it's hard not to so i've got four last rapid fire questions number one how do you come down from intense moments so you're speaking on stage you know, how do you come down from that? I'm always curious about that. Conan O'Brien in the documentary, Conan O'Brien Can't Stop, there's a scene where he's just performed at Radio City Music Hall and he's looking out at the crowd in the streets and he's like, I'm going to go down there for more. And his manager is like, please just go back to your bedroom. Like, and he says, you think I go from that to reading a Kindle? You're crazy. And he goes back into the street to continue the kind of adrenaline high. How do you, as somebody who gets to do really fun things that are intense, come down from that. Yeah. Um, Seinfeld talks about this, that he has to, after he goes on stage, he no one should be around him for the next hour because he has to shrink back into a, a normal sized person. 
Oh, that's so good. And and I, that that's that's what you're talking about is that hour of transition approximately is is a quite an uncomfortable experience because you're no longer doing the 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 quite almost inhuman thing of standing in front of hundreds or perhaps thousands of people entertaining educating competing with their phones for their attention so you've yeah. got to try to do you're all up of against that. every app you're, every, every app is fighting exactly you. and so you, you so that's highly intense but of course for those that love to do it highly um you know adrenaline driving experience uh, what i have found is helpful is to i will go for a walk like go for like a swift walk or if, if, if sometimes hotels will even have like bikes that they're renting and stuff if it's depending on the location and i will try and just get out and f- be physical and so it just kind of gets you you know all that energy gives you something for it to do i find that really helpful sometimes although i can't always do it because of the adrenaline experience you're describing but sometimes i will try and take a nap like just don't try and go from that energy to like oh i'm going to write or i'm going to respond to an email or i'm going to go do it's like that those ta- they don't match but if i can just yeah. lie down for a bit sometimes that will work and i'll just i'll just nap and then once you're it's like it's like you re- return back as a, as a as Bruce Banner. You're like, okay, okay, everything's everything's. <laughs> your all jeans right. are all torn. <laughs> you don't know your shirts in tatters. You're like, what happened to my thighs? Uh, Second question: When you're in writing mode, how long are you writing each day, and where do you write? Kind of a two parter. So, is it hours? Is it pages? I write here, right where this is happening, okay. which is, a, is is an office. I used to have a, a, a different. I used to be in a different house, a little office outside of the house. It was small, but I loved it. I sort of felt like it was a little writing haven or a little temple. Even I loved that. Sure. Um, the 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 how much and when has evolved. It has to be early in the morning for me. Uh, that's that's far easier. And I've learned that basically the goal is to do a couple of hours and to try and write two pages. Hmm. And if I can write two pages a day, it's like super high speed work. Yeah. And what I learned, especially when I was writing effortless was if I did three hours in the third hour, I could produce more, but not a full additional page. So that it became, that's like diminishing returns. But then if I went further than that, four, five, six, seven, eight hours, oh yeah, that's that's like negative returns. I am making the manuscript as a whole worse than if I had not written that book that day. And I better stop. That is my like, yeah. that is the tell. Yeah, I'm just, I'm messing with stuff. I'm going back to the stuff I wrote at the beginning. Well, what if I just did it this way? Oh, I've got a good idea. And you just can blow so much up. You cause so much trouble oh. in that. I don't want to be trusted. Yeah, yeah I, and I think points. that's helpful to people because I think people do think, okay, they expect the writer to say 10 hours a day. I do 10 hours a day. <laughs> I get up at 2 a.m. Like I send you funny things that I see where people post like, I get up at 3 a.m. and do burpees. And I love that <laughs> that answer I think will help people. Third question, effortless is probably around eyeballing it, 55,000 words, 50, 55,000 words. Okay. How many words did you have to write to get to that 55? That's a good question. Uh, I think I probably wrote four or five times that amount. Yeah. So I... Quarter mil, as the, the kids say in the streets. I, <laughs> that's what the kids are saying, I guess. Yeah, that's <laughs> what they're saying. A lot of street youths are saying that. That's how they would say yeah. it. I, I've never thought about it that way. And that is interesting. That it's like, you know, that, you know maybe that's the right number. Um, it might be more. I, I don't know. I just, the only thing I want to add to that is that I wanted effortless to have less words in it than essentialism. I didn't care how much less. I, and again, it was just an upper bound. It was just a forcing function to say, don't write some big voluminous book because you can, because somebody, no one will say no. And so that just helped keep me, keep me tight. But, but I don't know, I don't know if Effortless is a great book, but I know it's better than the books that I didn't publish. But you know, you put in great work too. Like that's the thing you control the thing you can control. You put you know, great, not, not impossible effort, but you put effort into it that to you equals, this is me giving the best of what I'm capable of. Yeah. On this subject, at this moment, the moment I finished that book, that, that was the best that I could do. And the great thing was I had a great team around me, the editor, same editor, I loved my editor. And, and then I, I had um, someone helping me with research, Jonathan Cullen, who was such a great member of Team Effortless. And working together with them was effortless. That was, I loved that experience when we were in there together. I, I used to think about it like Harry Potter, 
And it's, it's like yeah. it's like you'd go in and like Jonathan would be in there bringing a story that I'd asked him to go and research and bring in, and, he, and then Tally would be editing something that I'd been writing, and then and then I'd add, get to work on something else. And it was just pretty magical because it's in a Google Doc and you could see it all being worked on at ah, the same that's time. Great. Those moments were terrific. And I think I stepped on something important you said. You said it's a better book than all the books you didn't publish. Is that, yeah. is that how you said it? That is right. That's great. That is great. I, I love that. Okay, last question. When do you think you'll move to Nashville? <laughs> I just assume um, at some point everyone moves to Nashville. Do you guys already have that on a calendar? Is that in, you know, have you and your wife already planned? You're looking at house Because when you move from California to Nashville, you get the ball out. Like, I just want to be up front. Whatever you sell in North Malibu, you will have an estate. Like, you're going to have to name the property. Like, I don't know if that's something you do. Like, England, they name estates. Like, you're British. You could name it some manor or something. I'm just, that's what we have to offer. So is that in the cards? Like, I'm just curious. I have been to Nashville. I have spoken in Nashville. I don't remember what, what it was for now, but I loved Nashville. I love Nashville, which is, is it's, I'm avoiding your question. I'm going to write that down as a yes. Um, and we're going to take that as a yes. Good. Put it in the same uh, category can... as as the as the McConaughey, uh, you know, like yeah, love soundtrack, exactly. right? It's so in the same category. Yeah. I'm coming to he he loves soundtracks, and I'm coming uh, to Nashville. They're both true. They're both. Marvelous. You can probably buy like Tim McGraw's Lake House or something. I mean, I'm just going to say it's going to be nice. You should like make me jealous by like or make me hungry. You should send me. What 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 the uh, what the equivalent would be? I love that. exactly. I uh, I think it's funny talking about the effort you put in, the work, the wanting to have a ten year. I guarantee that on some of the podcasts you've done, people have said, "Are you writing a new book?" Like it's so funny how fast we want to move from, and like that's a crazy. I mean, and we're always <laughs> working on ideas. We're always working on ideas. But dude, your book came out Tuesday, and somebody's like, "So, um, Greg, tell us, What's tell next? us what the new book's about. What's the next book?" And you're like, "This one's barely the ink is barely dry." And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." But what's the next? I, one? I was what's doing podcasts two or three months ago when I first started doing a few podcasts, and so the book is not even out like for a while. And people still want to know that question. I had a friend who was a juggler who's like like award winning, like a like a career juggler. Does he have to beat other jugglers to do that? How do you how do you win awards? Is there a competition? I think it's like you out survive people, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's like Highlander. You steal their powers. You just like keep doing it when everyone else gets burned burned out. They're like, I gotta find myself <laughs> a different career. They get carpal and tunnel, and I mean, <laughs> there's so many injuries that can take out a juggler. You know, so like if you can do three, three, I can juggle with three balls, right? And and yeah. as soon as somebody does three, you say, oh, can you do four, five? And this yeah. guy can do like eight. But as yeah. soon as he does eight, all anyone wants to know is if he can do nine. It's like we're so easily, hey, we're done with that. What 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 have you got new for me? Yeah, there's a book series, the Mitford book series by Jan Karen. It's a book about a small town based on Blowing Rock. The two interesting things, she had to move out of Blowing Rock. She wrote a book series about her favorite small town. It got so successful, she could no longer live there. Because so many tourists came and would be like knocking on her front door. So that's the one interesting thing. The second thing is she said people would come up to her book signings and go, I loved your book. When's the next one? And she say, it took you three hours to read it. It took me three years to write it. Like we're, we're just at a different, <laughs> we're running at, we're running at a different pace. Like I'm uh, sorry. That's a it's, great a different... line. it's a great line. And that of course is the problem is that they, is that whether they're, once they're done reading it, they're like, okay, good. I, that's it. Now I will say this. I think, feel different about this the answer to this though than i did before i said before i effortless and, and I, don't, I just think it's random but i i do know what i want to write next and i'm very clear about it and i wasn't with it i wasn't after essentialism so i think it's very it's going to be different i'm hoping i'm, I'm going to get a lot of time to be able to write it because I, it's like um, but i shouldn't even be talking about this I know, I know. We'll keep it on the wraps. Well, Greg, this has been awesome. So tell people where they can find you, your work, your book, where, you know, if I want to know more about Greg, where am I going? Come join the What's Essential podcast, right? Like just go subscribe and be part of it. You get to hear this amazing author of soundtracks. Come and do a great episode. Uh, come and listen to it. Everyone plus should... Matthew McConaughey. Plus Matthew McConaughey. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and learn about whether he is in fact going to be want to run as the governor of Texas. That's um, we got, we got on that subject. That's a big question. On that subject and, uh, and many other interesting subjects. Uh, it actually was, it was an interesting episode because we did sort of the thing talking about his book, green lights and all that. And that was, I liked that. 
Uh, he is an essentialist in lots of ways. Um, I didn't know that. Because like, he had this line, listen to this essentialist line. He said, lean horse, long ride. And that's what he said. Hmm. But then it got to this point. We did a second episode because it got to this point right at the end of the episode. I asked him a question. I was, I was like, what's essential for you that you're underinvesting in? And he's, I thought the screen had frozen because for 10 seconds, he didn't say anything. He's just staring out like a Lincoln commercial? He's just staring almost at me slightly, slightly off, but just, and I thought, That's I don't want to interrupt because if he is thinking, I don't want to. And then finally, he just says, being a leader. And that launched us into a completely different conversation, which was oh. like a coaching conversation. It wasn't, we weren't doing a podcast anymore. It was like coaching. Yeah. And we went through and just asked him question after question, trying to understand what he meant by that, what he's going to do about that, and how he's going to proceed, and so on. And it was a really game. Uh, I thought it was an amazing moment. So, so people should listen to your the episode with you, and then the Matthew McConaughey uh, episodes, and and, and, um, and there we go. That's where they should find us. And Effortless is everywhere. Books are sold. Do you read the audiobook? Is it you on the audiobook? It is. For good or ill. No, that's good. You have a British accent. I've told you many times you have a leg up against us, us Yanks. It's one, it's 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 my only saving grace. <laughs> that is not true. That is not true. Well, Greg, thank you for joining me. I love this conversation. I can't wait for people to hear it. John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, that concludes our first ever two-part interview. I feel pretty good about it. I felt like it was enough content in both parts. It felt like they worked together. That was a good two-parter. That, that was good. I don't know if we'll do more in the future, but that one felt like it was worth it. Thank you for listening today. If you love this episode, please leave a review. The reviews you've been leaving have been awesome. See you next week. And remember, all it takes is a goal. This episode of the podcast was brought to you by MetaShare. Text John, J-O-N, to 474747 for more information. Huge thank you to MetaShare for sponsoring it. J-O-N to 474747. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes, transcript, and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast.